Here is your host, General Holland M. Smith, former commanding general, Fleet Marine Force, Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. From Guadalcanal to Bougainville, every tactical step we took in the Pacific was aimed at one objective, Rebao. It was a local point of Japanese power in the Bismarck Archipelago. Until it fell or was neutralized, our Tokyo Express was halted. Our combined airstrikes were damaging, but not crippling Japanese air, service, and ground power. In spite of our efforts, they were able to supply Rabol. When our chiefs of staff saw it could not be isolated by air power, they made plans to capture it. There were upwards of 90,000 enemy troops on the island, and we knew that taking it would be costly. It is December 25th, 1943. On board, at sea, we sing familiar words to familiar tunes in unfamiliar surroundings. Chaplains tell the familiar story, the miracle of Christmas. But to us, miracles seem antiquated and far away. Tomorrow, we will open a different package, the island of New Britain. Hot, humid, steeped in the exotic odor of decay. Mosquitoes king-sized will swarm over us. Spiders as big as dinner plates will crawl over us. Wasps three inches long will sting us. Rivers will burst their banks trying to drown us and trees will fall, killing 20 of us. Miracles seem for the past. Our worry is the future. But although we do not know it, intelligence has misevaluated an aerial photograph and laid the groundwork for another Christmas miracle. For the 1st Marine Division, this is our first battle since Guadalcanal. It is strangely quiet ashore, but we know they are there. They should have cut loose by this time. Must be waiting for point blank range. They're letting us get ashore. into the jungle and your feet would still be in the water. So far, not a shot has been fired. No enemy encountered. We have landed with complete immunity. With his superior knowledge of the terrain, General Matsuda had placed his limited forces with considerable shrewdness. Had the Marines known as much about the area while making their plans as a new one hour after their landing, they probably would have chosen one of the beaches where they were expected. But as man projects his training, his reasoning, his background, and his experience toward ultimate effort, the ten-star general often watches over his shoulder and with positive strokes of swift certainty covers the flaws, redraws a perfect plan. A ditch at Waterloo, the opening of the Red Sea, the bridge at Remagen. At Cape Gloucester, it was faulty intelligence. Oblique photographs taken during the pre-landing bombing strikes 
showed hundreds of bomb craters full of water. Since there were virtually no rim shatters, it indicated a high water table at almost ground level. Today, with hindsight, we know this. Then, we did not. And the fact that we did not know it resulted in complete tactical surprise. Some would call this misinterpretation luck. Others, fortune. Most of us recognize it as divine guidance. On the day after Christmas, the Marines landed where they were not expected, caught General Matsuda by surprise and split his forces without the loss of a single man. This is our miracle. We hack, push, shove, crawl, anything to get through the jungle. And suddenly we find why the enemy did not expect us here. Damp flat, our map makers designated it. Damp flat. A bog, a quagmire, a swamp, a morass, sinkhole. Damp, clear up to your chin. This is for ducks and mermaids. There is no bottom to the goo. Imagine having to move artillery and heavy equipment through 400 yards of this. A forest giant loosened by bombardment tottered, crashes, and we suffer our first marine casualty. We slip and slide through 900 yards of this. No wonder the enemy is not here to oppose our progress. He'd have to do his fighting from a canoe. Finally, one unit reaches firm footing, begins its advance toward the airfield. Enemy riflemen bar the way. Their general counterattack is swift, vicious, and lasts four hours. With our bazookas, we score repeated hits, and repeatedly, the projectile malfunctions. Again, nothing. The first of our daily cloud bursts arrive. There is no shelter or escape. Shoes, socks, uniforms, equipment, all are drenched and will never be fully dry until we are taken from the island many weeks hence. Now we know why the bazooka rockets do not detonate. The earth is a chocolate sponge, sucking the projectile into the mushy softness, smothering it in impotence. We need tank support. So bulldozers scrape and fill and a road of sorts is begun. One particular bunker is giving us a bad time. Ammunition runs low. And the only vehicle able to reach us is the Amtrak. Behind us, somewhere, the road is still being gouged. We hear a snorting, a clanking, a wheezing. Someone is going to have tank support. We ready the bazooka. But it is ours. It is welcome. It is stuck. Help comes from an unexpected source. In the open, the driver exposed to enemy fire. The driver becomes a casualty. Another Marine volunteers for his job and is hit. We give the third Marine withering covering fire. 
And this third bears the charm. Drivers are vindicated. They have given service above and beyond. The attack moves forward. Then began the case of the disappearing enemy. He was near. Evidence of his presence was everywhere, but somehow Colonel Sumilia managed to withdraw his troops after each engagement. The Marines could not find his real concentration of strength. On December 28, 1943, mud and rain caved in the position of Corporal Kashida Shigeto. The good corporal had been indoctrinated to expect torture and death. Instead, he was dug out given K-ration and a cigarette. He talked freely and indicated the presence of the 141st and 142nd regiments. This rocked General Rupertus, General Shepard, and their staffs back on their heels. One unit was not supposed to be on New Britain and the other many miles away. If the corporal's information was correct, the enemy was capable of throwing greater strength into the counterattack that had been anticipated. Patrols scout Razorback Ridge. Wherever he is, he has done a good job of hiding. Today, he is nowhere. Tomorrow, he is everywhere, fighting. Five hours later, he withdraws and again disappears. Where was the main body of troops? With their limited knowledge of the terrain, the Marines sent units to block any retreat. They reported no sign of withdrawal. He was still somewhere within the area. The first clue came in the form of a message sent by Japanese Lieutenant Abe. It read, it is essential that we conceal the fact that we are maintaining positions on Aogiri Ridge. Here at last was a probable location of enemy strength. But where was Aogiri Ridge? Our own map showed two main elevations, Hill 660 and the smaller hill 150. The terrain on which his attack might come and through which ours must move was a mystery. Unusual situations demand unusual tactics, and General Shepard devised one. He proposed to hold fast on the left and center of the beach perimeter, while the right of the line redeployed and attacked generally to the southeast on a front of a thousand yards. As the movement was begun, reaction was immediate. For two days, we fight an enemy we cannot see. Artillery, mortar shells, and air bombs are almost useless. They cannot penetrate the dense forest overhead. We need tanks to spearhead us across Suicide Creek. Again, the bulldozers build a road for the tanks. But the creek banks are too steep and have to be caved in by the dozers. Again, drivers become casualties. And again, the job is finished. The first takes the plunge. But again, the enemy withdrew. And again, we knew that Aogiri Ridge had not been found. As our lines moved forward, Hill 150 became the next suspect of Japanese strength. The 1st Battalion, 7th Marine, moved against it and secured it after surprisingly weak resistance. The invisible enemy 
and the location of Aogiri Ridge began to haunt the Marines. Most deductions placed it from 1,000 to 2,000 yards southwest of Hill 150. They are wrong. We sense we have found it, but we cannot explain the reason. The ground seems level, yet it rises as we progress. We push on. Then, for two days, we do not advance. Efforts to flank the position fail, so the dozers build another causeway for the tanks. One battalion loses two commanding officers within five hours. The third is destined for hand-to-hand -hand fighting and will leave his name to mark this stubborn, violent, invisible corner of Hades where we fight. We inch forward. One day. Two days. Three unending days. Four nightmares, five centuries, six millenniums, seven eternities. The week's progress can be measured in feet. Attempts to encircle are stopped cold. This is Aogiri Ridge. By now, the question was not whether the Marines could advance, but whether they could hold their hard-earned gain. It was then, in the words of the division's special action report, that Colonel Walt's leadership and courage turned the tide of battle. Putting his shoulder to the wheel of a 37 millimeter gun, he began pushing, shoving. Colonel Walt pulled both arms from their shoulder sockets, but he kept shoving. And his men, his magnificent Marines, added their strength. By superhuman effort, the gun was manhandled up the steep slope and into position to sweep the ridge. The Marines and the enemy were 30 feet apart. But as the Marines occupied one end of the ridge, so did the Japanese. Colonel Walt could hear them grouping for an attack. Four times they banzai from only yards away. We hold our fire until the crucial moment. As they regroup for the fifth attack, we are dangerously low on ammunition. A battalion command post detail gets it through with less than four minutes to spare. The fifth is furious, fast-paced, final. Banzai is ended. Aogiri Ridge is ours. At 0800, on 10 January, the Marines advanced five companies abreast towards the next high ground. They soon discovered why Aogiri Ridge had been so important to the enemy. Behind it lay a wide, firm, much used trail that did not show on our maps. It had been the chief route of supply and reinforcement for the Bogan Bay area. But it was still evident that the enemy had been able to withdraw several thousand troops. Now begins one of the war's most gigantic games of hide and seek. The enemy is retreating toward Rabaul. Somewhere in the 8,000 square mile area of western New Britain, he is fleeing. On 26 January, his main route is discovered. Ground patrols chase him to the east. Kokopo, Borisi, Kari'ai, Iboki, Talawaga, Abmadan, Bulawatini, Ogitni. Trail juncture for the escaping units from Cape Mercus. They are ahead of us. Other units leapfrog up the coast. 
A few seconds after the picture of this patrol in the Natoma area was taken, a Japanese machine gun, hidden by the underbrush, opened fire, killing two and wounding several others. If this strong enemy positions on the Willamette's Peninsula could be overrun, the Marines would have an excellent interception point for all retreating units in transit between Ojetni and Numondo Point. Since sea and air control were now in our hands, the move was undertaken in 38 LCMs and 17 LCVPs of the Army's 553rd Engineer Boat Battalion and five LCTs from the Navy. This was a daring and tricky maneuver. The small boats would have to cross 60 miles of open sea, maintain contact and position throughout the night, arriving at their objective shortly after dawn. It was born of haste and necessity. American planes were scheduled to pick up the convoy at first light. As dawn jumps over the horizon, we look for them. None comes. We stand offshore, waiting for the aerial cover, which is to protect us until we are unloaded. None comes. Later, we will learn it is not their fault. They are weathered in. But now, we are not consoled. But if the airmen of other services had forgotten us, our own had not. We look up, give a mighty cheer. Marine air cover has arrived. With complete disregard for their personal safety, Captain Theodore A. Petrus and his passengers dive through heavy enemy machine gun fire and drop 30 grenades. It was an act of great personal bravery. However, the craters thus created scarcely impeded the Marines as they dashed to shore. Fortunately, opposition to the landing was light, and although stiff resistance developed as fighting progressed, the Marines overran the Willamette Peninsula. But once again, the invisible enemy retreated into invisibility. For the last time on New Britain, he disappeared. After 18 months, during which it had dominated all our planning, all our thinking, and all our fighting, Rebaul was now isolated. Rebaul was now impotent. Rebaul was now strategically unimportant. We did not pursue the retreating enemy. Possession of the western portion secured the right flank for the push up to the Philippines and isolated more than 90,000 enemy forces at Rabu. 90,000 Japanese who would still be there until the day of surrender. 90,000 Japanese cut off from supply or transfer to other battle areas. 90,000 men who would not fire a single shot or kill a single American. 90,000 men withering and inactivated in the backwash of the war. These are the contestants. The Japanese Zero. Light, fast, tricky, maneuverable. The American F-2A, heavy, slow, stodgy, tied to a string. This, one nation's product for aggressive intent. And this, another's product of neglect. The object, aerial supremacy. The result, disastrous.
plane can be designed in weeks, built in months. It takes years to grow a pilot. One has a dollars and cents valuation, and the other is a more precious commodity. Here is your host, General Holland M. Smith, former commanding general, Fleet Marine Force, Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. Between wars, the military usually suffers budget trouble from the lack of adequate appropriations. The result is inevitable. We are unable to develop and maintain progress abreast of the nation, which are potential aggressors. The Marine Corps did not want to send its pilots out to fight a faster plane at Midway, but it had no choice. By scraping the bottom of the limited aviation valve, we managed to come up with 64 obsolete planes, 36 dive bombers, and 28 fighters. We knew they were no match for the Japanese zeros, but what could we do? They were the best we had. They were all we had. And although the role our pilots and crews played was a minor one, we paid a high price for obsolescence. Steaming confidently across the threatless Pacific come six of the Pearl Harbor attack fleet. Soryu, Kiryu, Tone, Chikina, Tanakaze, Urakaze. To a confused public trying to learn a new language, the words and ships and places and men of World War II they sound like dialectic malaprops. Their destination, Midway. Their purpose, to strike, damage, harass, destroy, and then continue to their homeland. Midway is not scheduled for invasion at this time. But the weather was rough and Wake Island rougher so they were diverted towards that tragic atoll. This gave Midway an additional six months to prepare for invasion. Their first sample of enemy intent was received on the night of December the 7th. On the shore, a lookout observes the light flashing southwest of Sand Island. At 9 p.m., enemy destroyers Akibona and Yushio begin their bombardment. the shells fall harmlessly until a lucky hit ignites the hangar roof. With this orientation point, the enemy pounds the torpedo and bomb site building, powerhouse, parachute loft, and radio transmitter building. An early hit on the communications center reduces coordinate effectiveness. But the officers and men of the 6th Marine Defense Battalion scored damaging but not fatal hits on the enemy, and both withdraw toward their homeland. And one of them is marked by destiny. For the Yushio of all the ships and carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor is the only one which will be afloat on that distant day when the war is ended. During the time at his disposal, Lieutenant Colonel Wallace who commanded Midway's Marine Aviation Detachment, reported that operators were being inducted into the mysteries of radar. Personnel shelters were being built. Portable fueling expedients devised for emergency. A propeller shop was set up and a machine shop was under construction. Midway was preparing to repel invasion. Complacent behind the barrier of a difficult language, Tokyo speaks to its people, and we record. Tokyo transmits to its outposts, and we transcribe. 
Tokyo's fleet talks back and forth. And we listen. Our ears are glued to the keyholes of the Pacific. How can we who cannot pronounce their simple everyday words hope to crack their intricate code? But it has been done. The garbled word is ungarbled. The scrambled, unscrambled. Their intent is clear. Invasion. Time in May. Location. They are too clever, and so we must deduce. Hawaii, says Washington. Midway, says Admiral Nimitz. And Admiral Nimitz was right. Available planes and pilots from the Army Air Force, Navy, and Marines were dispatched to Midway, as well as five more anti-aircraft batteries detached from the 3rd Defense Battalion at Pearl Harbor, two rifle companies of the 2nd Marine Raider Battalion, and a platoon of five light tanks for Mobile Reserve. Plane shelters and two new 4,000-gallon gasoline tanks were built. A command post was completed, and camouflage and sandbagging of key installations were increased. Subsequent radio intercepts revised the date of attack and enabled additional planes to be sent. By the 31st of May, the airfield in Eastern Island is choked with aircraft. Twenty-one Army Air Force, six torpedo-carrying Navy TBFs, 16 Navy PBYs for reconnaissance, and 64 marine planes. 36 are dive bombers, commanded by Major Henderson, with Major Ben Norris second in command. And 28 fighters, led by Major Parks, with Captain Armistead as his second. Somewhere to the north, or east, or south, or west. The mightiest battleship ever built is ready, Yamato. 63,700 tons of invasion. In the periphery, Japan's two largest carriers, the Akagi, the Kaga. The Hiryu and Soryu are smaller, but no less deadly. Two battleships, three cruisers, and a score of destroyers accompany. On board are the invasion troops to stamp the Emperor's mark on Midway. 2,500 Army, 1,500 from the Special Naval Landing Force, and 1,000 from the Ichiki Detachment, who will live through Midway and die on Guadalcanal. June 3rd, 0900. The pilot of a reconnaissance plane spots 11 vessels of the enemy. Supposition is fact. The target is Midway. B-17s find the fleet and drop their bombs. Near misses are bracketed, but the fleet closes toward Midway. June 4th, 0525 AM. The enemy has maintained his course. The message is relayed, received, and radar picks up many planes bearing 310. Distance, 89 miles. Another pilot spots a carrier, bearing 320. Distance, 180 miles. Marine Aircraft Group 22's missions are assigned.
snarl their readiness. Twelve fighters, led by Major Parks, will intercept the planes. Thirteen fighters, led by Captain Armistead, will hold a position ten miles from Midway to intercept any breakthrough or attack from as yet undiscovered units. into two divisions. The 16 SBDs under Major Henderson are faster and will therefore attack the Japanese fleet. They must inflict prompt and early damage to the enemy carrier flight decks if their recurring attacks are to be stopped. The slower bombers, led by Major Norris, have the same assignment. The carriers, we are airborne, jubilant, determined, welcoming the conflict. We fly for the Marine Corps, our country, and our comrades. Retaliate for Pearl. Strike for Wake. Avenge Batan. We are 12 Marine fighter planes, 30 miles out at 14,000 feet. And there, beneath the cocksure enemy, his fighters below his bomber. He does not see us. Peel off, dive for speed, disrupt the hairline bees that head for midway. We are 12, and he, 108. The odds are even. Scratch into his first wave of horizontal bombers and keep on scratching until 16 do not live to reach midway. Goslings of a gluttonous goose. And now, rising through the disrupted waves of bombers, comes the Zero. Paper mache with an engine, a tinderbox. We will send him to join his fallen nest mates. We will center him in our gun sight. Scratch, one of ours. And another. And another. And keep on scratching until nine of twelve are gone. Scratch until our squadron is no more. Scratch until only three of 12 live to report back. But our comrades in the slower planes, they have less chance than we. But scratch for them too. And in the second wave, a few zeros and 18 enemy bombers do not make their objective. We were 25, now we are nine. 16 down and vulnerable. We have learned our antiquated planes are no match for the zero. We have been outclimbed, outdived, outmaneuvered. As a fighter force, Marine Fighter Squadron 221 ceases to exist, except on paper. The heavy loss to the fighter squadron was being felt farther afield. A normal mission would have continued to the enemy fleet to engage the Japanese Zeros and give our dive bombers a clear run over their target. 
But the loss of our fighters did not stop the 16 Marine bombers. They arrived at their objective at 0800, altitude 8,500 feet, and started a long circle to launch a glide bombing approach from 4,000 feet. They were 4,000 feet short of their desired altitude when the zeros hit. Scratch, eight of ours. Eight of 16. The remaining planes score near misses of 20, 50, 80, and 150 meters. Machine gunning kills four enemy crewmen but no direct hits are registered. The slow SB2Us arrive 15 minutes later and find the Zeros waiting. In the aerial fighting, they find themselves at the opposite end of the fleet axis from the carrier. To traverse the screening vessel's fire would be useless suicide. They pick a new target, the battleship Haruna. Only two and one half crews. The pilot lives to fight again. As a single drop multiplies to form the deluge, so did the efforts of those who were lost become an important part of the aerial storm which was to overwhelm the Japanese fleet. The 25 Marine fighters had so weakened the bomber strike against Midway that the Japanese air commander asked for a second attack wave. On the enemy carriers, a state of readiness. Fighters, warmed and ready, line the flight deck, ready to intercept, disrupt, destroy. Admiral Nagumo was in a state of indecision. 79 Army, Navy, and Marine planes had attacked his fleet. 53 had been destroyed. He had received no reports of American carriers in the vicinity, and so was persuaded that our air power had been destroyed. Decision is made. Clear the decks. Break the state of readiness. Take the fighters below and bring the torpedo bombers topside. One by one, they leave their iron nest. The decks are clear. It was a natural but fatal mistake. And when a scout plane radios American carrier, it is too late. Fighter planes cannot be brought up in time or in sufficient number to defend. And the decks must be kept clear to receive the planes returning from Midway. Now he is vulnerable. And vulnerable he remains as carrier dive bombers from the Hornet, Enterprise, and Yorktown begin their attack. Akagi, Kaga, for you, hear you, for malaprops, erased forever from our linguistic nightmare. And as the enemy birds return to find their nests are missing, they have but one eventual choice. But war must go on. On June 5, Six marine fighters and six marine bombers are flyable. Twelve of yesterday's 64. They are sent to attack two retreating heavy cruisers. The 
SBDs begin their dive at 10,000 feet. They bracket the Mogami with near misses. Five of six are lost. As the fighters come in at 4,000 feet, conjecture and controversy are born, which continue until this day. An American, a captain, a Marine, makes his approach toward the enemy, begins his dive. Messengers of opposition fire his plane. He cannot hear the song of his flight or the thunder of his wings. His actions are history. He crashes into the Makuma. His reasons become the conjecture. Unavoidable accident, says some historians. Kamikaze, says Japanese Admiral Soji. I saw a dive bomber dive into our last turret. He was very brave. But in the analysis of his example, there is no room for conjecture. It is service, inspired devotion above and beyond to his country and his corps. He too was a Marine.